Um, but uh, so we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Abe Lee with us today, um, taking a, a couple days off from serving as chair and uh, one of the leaders of the microsystems world just to come down and talk to us. I appreciate it's it. Nice That's, of you to do so. It's been fun. Um, so uh, Abe uh, received a bachelor's degree in power mechanical engineering from National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Um, did his PhD in mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley. Uh, best public university in the Bay Area. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, after that, he went to uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs mm -hmm. and eventually came over, uh, did some time at DARPA, uh, NIH, and then joined the faculty at UC Irvine. And currently, as I mentioned, is serving as chair of biomedical engineering there. Um, uh, maybe an even more notable position, he's associate editor of Lab on a Chip. So I invite everybody up after the talk to ask why your paper didn't get the <laughs> <laughs> Like mine. <laughs> um, and also, uh, I wanted to make sure I get the name of this award correctly. So in 2009, received the uh, Pioneers of Miniaturization Prize, uh, recording at Lab on a Chip, and also as fellow at uh, ASME and, and AMB. Um, and as I mentioned, recognized certainly as one of the leaders of the microsystems world. So um, thanks for coming to talk to us today. Thank you, Ian, for the kind introduction. So I, um, it's very, very pleased to be here. I'm, and more than, I guess, in many of my talks, I, Marilyn has a lot of, I guess, that's part of, I guess, being academician. You go somewhere, there's all these connections. But this is particularly more than more, most places. I was just passing by, uh, and I saw an office says C.D. Moat. <laughs> he was... Uh, he was the, I almost worked in his lab, he was, uh, he was, he was I guess he offered me a graduate, uh, graduate assistant position, um, and I know he's been here for many years, um, ever since, and um, I've known both uh, Don and Elizabeth for, I think, close to 20 years now, so, I think twice, right? <laughs> And uh, so, and my brother, we're going way back, got his um, undergrad degree in biochemistry at U University of Maryland College Park. So uh, I came here when he was an undergrad, so it goes way back. Um, he was a high school student in Walt Whitman around here somewhere. So a lot of connections here. My uncle used to teach at Catholic University, so it's in DC. So this is a place very, really close to heart. Um, but I've been, you know, on the other coast for some time, so I'm going to try to uh, give you a little bit of, um, share a little bit of the journey I, I took uh, since, um, since actually again, three years in, in Arlington um, for DARPA and NIH, and then uh, now 12 years at UC Irvine. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, of course, mostly about my research, maybe introduce a little bit about the department so just so you can fill you in what uh, UC Irvine is all about. But since I did mention DARPA and I put this slide in here. I just, this is a slide that we used back um, in 1999 when we were trying to start a program called the BioInfo Micro Program. I don't know if some of you may have heard about it, but um, the idea back there, and more importantly, is the idea behind all these research, um, <coughs> all research being so siloed, you know, be, people are in biology, never talk to people in uh, electronics or, or micro back then micro just started not too long uh, information technology people computer they're just all different they're all in their own labs and they build these big empires never talk to each other um, more importantly at that time we've just identified these three areas uh, and then figured there's also a true fundamental difference but micro people uh, electronics specifically people have are very very dry right <laughs> they're they're doing electronics and and Elizabeth lab is, is definitely taking this to the next level but back then it was very uh, you know if you go to the clean room you never think about anything biology it's 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 a place where things don't live right <laughs> it's uh, very very toxic materials they're hazardous materials and bio of course in, in a very different world you want everything to live things that you want to live live um, and and that's also a challenge on its own so we started this program, and the main criteria back then was uh, when we went to these site visits, there were six main projects that were funded, we went to all these um, places, uh, and we first thing we did was separate them and talk to them, oh, so what do you do, and how do you collaborate, and so what is it that you do with them, and we found that everyone were just doing their thing, they put the proposal, it looks like it's together, but they're truly, in the, the projects um, 
incorporating each side was they, they, it was not, it was a new somewhat of a new concept back then. Um, so so that was a good experience, and and ever since I think we've we've been able to see the difference of having people work together and and departments like biomedical engineering, bioengineering got started all over the country um, and forced the issue. There's a lot of other parts of the mess that you have to manage as well, but it's all kind of good in terms of um, crosstalk and learning each other's languages and, and developing cross uh, interface kind of technology, multidisciplinary teams and multidisciplinary people. That's the most important thing as a university is to train these people to know things across the disciplinary boundaries. Um, another slide from the DARPA days, kind of slightly um, augmented or modified is this uh, complexity issue, meaning <coughs> between the biological uh, world where, uh, and, and back then already starting to see the internet's power, the computers, network computers, DARPA had of course a lot to do with that, so they wanted to see, there's, they, they saw that the potential of this processing connecting computers and data, um, information, communication all together, and then um, they just identified, well the complexity of bio people started to know with the genome, human genome. Back then was not even yet cracked completely, it was almost being, I know everyone's doing a different chromosome, um, and uh, the bioprocessing became a big thing. And so the complexity of both worlds just felt natural that in the future they will be interconnected and there would be information processors with biological processors, the information will go back and forth and it will make a difference in environmental, in healthcare, in computation in, its, in itself. And so many possible um, visions came about, inspired, bio-inspired microprocessor, bionic cells and so on. You know, some of them are still being pursued but um, none, I, think, I think that's again just showing where the potential fertile ground is for this, these things to happen. And now I think the other part of it is, is the human side. Um, being in BME we do focus a lot more on you know, how do you make a difference in um, Oh, I always talk to my students, we talk about MEMS, nanotechnology and so on. I said, well, well, we really want to affect the meter scale, right? You talk, talk about the, the human scale. And however you do, it eventually feeds into the meter scale. So that's where I think um, a lot of things that are happening, people are starting to know um, starting even before all this revolution came about, people talked about artificial organs, they talked about artificial kidneys, artificial hearts, there were a lot of great technology, more of an engineering top-down approach. Um, but now with the chip scale technology and the ability to manipulate in the cellular and subcellular uh, and looking at the network of systems, systems biology, signaling, uh, cell signaling, you're starting to see again that crosstalk between the two complexities. Um, but more importantly is, is then you have simple devices, relatively speaking, um, monitoring systems that are starting to be our piggy, we can piggyback on them, uh, things that are implanted, things that are wearable, uh, so Google Glasses, you, you can see the potential exploding and I think it's so that I, I usually use this as more of a pumping up uh, kind of introduction to students and, and, and some sometimes seminars like this to just say there's just so much we can do connecting the complexity but also implementing simple things on uh, individual mobile devices and so on that's happening as we speak. So finally, last introduction slide is is a little bit of what I do in the lab but I, I, in BME, I talk about BME, but I think in a sense that top-down approach, you know, people knowing fluid dynamics, knowing um, neuro electronics, trying to do neural networks, uh, these top-down approaches, looking at the complexity, um, and then from the simple skill up, you know, single molecule, single uh, cell, now single cell is very popular, um, and then getting into organ on a chip, eventually into um, building up organs or understanding how to develop a treatment and diagnosis on the same platform. Um, I, 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 like, I tend to think that microfluidics turns out to be an area I was not trained in, I was MEMS more, more, more or less, but then microfluidics really kind of marries the, the wet side and the dry side very well um, and separates them when you need to and, and, um, and have them crosstalk when you, also when you need to. Uh, so maybe you can a little bit look at uh, microfluidics, I think as the bottom up <laughs> um, maybe systems, these we call systems biology, maybe systems bioengineering, um, but those aspects I think are starting to be hardware implemented so that a lot of things that we've been doing and complexity of, of the, of the bio biology can be realized in true systems and verified. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm not to say that the things done in my lab, these 
three areas that I'm going to focus primarily on um, are even even close to the tip of iceberg of all the things you can do. Um, but it hopefully just gives you a picture of what a lot of people are doing, including my lab, is trying to you know look at these little components, these little um, manipulations of molecules and proteins and cells, and all the way up to monitoring devices, uh, drug screening, drug discovery, drug delivery, for that matter. Um, how it can build up to now start to get close to the devices that, that are being, um, you know, already applied to um, healthcare and so on. If I have time, I might talk a little about some of the sample preparation and point of care devices in the lab. So I'll focus first on mentioning bottom up. So. Um, so this is a field that probably you've heard a lot of many talks of in this area, and, and uh, you probably bear with me. There's, there's some similar things that are coming out here. So we started working on droplet microfluidics in, when I first got at UCI, partially because I saw a paper in, uh, I didn't see Steve Quake's paper, I just saw, actually saw David Waite's paper, but before he ever did droplet microfluidics, it was, a, it was a droplet passing through oil and water, I mean oil first, and then going to water, and then somehow um, you decorated the outside with a lipid layer, and so I thought, wow, that looks just like a, well, not knowing enough biology back then, so that looks like, and it's still not knowing, um, a, a lipid layer around it, it seems like an artificial cell in my mind, can we just engineer that and just put different things on it? So when I got to UCI, um, I, I continued the work that I've been doing before, which was more in the um, magnetohydrodynamic microfluidics, and, and had a couple things there that went in a different area. Um, but I asked one of my students to say, let's, let's make some artificial cells and, and do some kind of this oil-water interface work. And so that's how we got started. He went home, and I didn't, have the, I didn't know what material to buy, what surfactant to buy, so he went home and got things from his fr refrigerator, uh, some vegetable oil, and made some first droplets that way. So that was kind of the, the first level of our, my lab's experience in 2002 when I started at UCI. Um, but ever since then, the idea was to do this artificial cell, and that was always my, my purpose. I wanted to make an artificial cell that has lipid bilayers, has control transport inside and outside of the, the droplet, and has the sensing mechanisms, meaning binding and things that trigger down, down um, events, down like a, like a um, like a cell signaling process, trying to learn from biologists that way. So I'm still working that way and, and really not made a lot of progress, except last week I felt pretty excited. There was one student that started to make some progress there. But, um, but, but we made a big detour using the droplets, and, and many of you may know about this field, has gone a long ways in terms of taking these individual droplets, compartmentalizing, um, using surface tension, using laminar flow, using shear force to create um, droplets, very monodispersed, very controlled, traveling through a channel, taking um, a volume of fluid and breaking up to, you know, a large number of them. And so, um, well, first focus on the idea of, you know, first doing microscale fluidics. Uh, the first thing you you notice is the scaling, uh, allowing you to be focusing on the um, laminar flow regime. So basically, your very very regular flow. Um, I mean, very, very, very controlled and oriented flow. I, I tell students always like a highway that everyone's, everyone's traveling in their own lane and they never cross the traffic. So it's, it's an ideal utopian world in terms of being a little molecule in the this, in this stream uh, or in the sense. Um, uh, but then it's very important to have a lot of crosstalk to be social. So, um, so this has the best of both worlds. When you have them orderly, you can have them traveling, you can deliver things in and they don't readily mix like this actually, this channel shows here. Once they enter the droplets, um, because of the recirculation and the 3D effect, um, you have surface, uh, it, with some control, as you can see, there's these, these meandering um, serpentine channels with a little bit of rough edges, allows mixing to happen rapidly in, in within, you know, a, at least 100 microsec microseconds um, or less. Uh, you can have rapid mixing, so you have a thing that's really, really nice, your analytical tool when fluids come together, you know when exactly they mix together, and you almost know exactly when they start to interact or uniformly um, be mixed together. As you can see, they're not completely mixed, the laminar flow effect is still, I guess if you have, I guess we have, oh, this is good, truly mechanical. Um, 
not photonic second. So there's the little rings there that laminar flow remnants are still there, and um, they. So again, this is this is a very simple analytical tool that that allow the explosion of many many um, you know applications. So best of both worlds, mono dispersed volumes, mo precise as a result. Um, uniform reactions, rapid mixing, and precise concentrations. So you almost can say it's, it's like generating a, um, a large array that's 3D instead of a microarray where you have the, the surface that's 2D, immobilized, you have 3D, and, and things that are dynamically... Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> it's hard. Maybe I'll do juggling. Um, so, yeah, okay. So this is this is these are little droplets traveling in here, and you can control some of the gradients that are coming out, um, creating uh, gradient in this case green and red fluorescence uh, signal. You can have this controlled gradient. You can redo it. You can change the the slope of the um, gradient and so on. So a very very rapid versatile screening platform for biochemical uh, assays. So you can quickly say sample one two three four, and in the in the previous slide as you see, you can go up to six or seven in our examples. Uh, allowing you to do a lot of very simple things, but very accurately, precisely, and temporarily, spatially controlled. Um, so with that kind of process, we were able to, I would just kind of show some old work, and that's the thing about giving seminars that has hopefully have enough time to show many things that we did in the past years. And, um, but this is, this, is, this is early work of trying to generate this array, had, had two, two inlets, so you can control the ramping of two, one going down, one going up. Um, so as a result, you can maybe program them to one to have um, um, salt and the other one have the protein. Uh, and uh, if the high protein is higher concentration, you have the protein sa super saturated, say the other one has a salt crystal. And then eventually you find the place where you have the best crystal and uh, crystals formed in the droplet. So we have, a very, again, a rapid screening of protein crystallization or salt crystallization. depends on what kind of, what kind of crystal you're trying to monitor. But this is an example of something that instead of a pendulum drop volume, that you control the humidity, control the size, <coughs> and control the temperature and all these things uh, in a single droplet. You have many, many droplets and you quickly find the sweet spot. Um, and we took this to many papers actually. I'll show a couple examples of the papers. This is one example of trying to, and people do this again. I, what we did early on, I had some students come in, really um, had some industrial experience. So Albert is an example. He worked in industry, did PCR, he did molecular beacons. And so he knew one thing that people were doing was um, they, when you, when you generate a molecular beacon for detection of DNA purposes, um, a signal to noise ratio is very critical. And what happens is you need to have uh, a, a, a certain balance of the ionic concentration so that, for instance, in this case, magnesium and the potassium ions have to balance it such that you have um, the most stable um, molecular beacon when, it's, when, it's, uh, when the target is not there, but when it's open, it's also very stable. So you have this contrast of signals, open and closed. This, when it's closed, obviously, this is quenched, so no fluorescence. When it's open, it has fluorescence. So you want to that signal to contrast the highest, signal to noise ratio is the highest, um, and you have to have the right balance of, of the ionic solution. Um, and the process to do that was basically lots of, well, in, in the words of what Albert was saying, you simply have these tighter plates and you have to quickly, you have to mix the right different ratios and then you put them in there and you look at the fluorescence signal uh, and then you find the right combination. And there's many, many, in this case, many, many inlets um, that you have to balance them with. Um, so it, we, we had, um, well, we have the molecular beacon, we have the, in, the, in this sense, the, uh, the, these two solutions that have the magnesium and the potassium ions. Um, and uh, we, we basically start to pump them in and ramp the ratios, fixing one at a time um, and then ramping one of them and then, and then finding the optimized um, uh, concentration of one ion and then fixing that and then going to the second one by, um, by ramping the second one and, 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 and so on. So basically we made, this, um, made these charts that looked at the concentration, one going up, ramping one, fixing another, and looking at the, the so-called signal-to-noise ratio and see how high the first one, you kind of get a signal-to-noise ratio going from, from a, um, 
the original of 20 up to 82, um, and then you fix that one, at, uh, this one, this can magnesium, you fix it, and then you ramp the uh, potassium ion, and you further improve the signal to noise ratio to 124, um, and we verified that with the conventional techniques. Um, so we get, get about um, two orders of magnitude higher uh, signal to noise ratio in 30 minutes of our droplet, just push, push them in, ramp them, and find the right fluorescence. Uh, whereas the, um, the conventional way to do it takes four to six hours at least. Sometimes people do it longer. Um, it's very tedious, labor-intensive work where this is automated. Nothing too fancy. We're just taking what people do um, in a lab setting and nothing fundamentally new, but uh, something that's very convenient, very good tool for people to use. So that just shows you the power, I think, of, of some of these uh, very simple ones, and you can see many things you cannot do, and I know I, I know that too, um, and becomes that becomes the research part of it. Um, but we enabled that. This is another example of taking um, DNA and cationic lipids. So we worked on. We're trying to. We had a collaborator that wanted to. That that's an expert in um, so-called lipoplexes. It's for gene transfection. It's a non-viral gene transfection. So it's very desirable in many ways. You don't have to use um, E. coli or bacteria to um, to house these processes for transfection um, and, and some of the viral uh, possible side effects. Um, so all it is is l mixing the uh, positively charged lipid and the negatively charged DNA um, and having, having them at the right ratios, concentrations, so that you generate these lipoplexes, which are basically nanoparticles of the, of the charge uh, balance between the, the cationic lipids and the, and the, and the DNA. Um, so originally how they make it is a process um, more similar to a mixing process. Again, taking two um, solutions together. When you mix them, um, there's always a heter heterogeneous or non-homogeneous mixing result. It means some particles are small, some are big. These nanoparticles are polydispersed. Whereas in here you have droplets that are rapidly mixing, so you know again, you, they're separate until they enter in the mixing region, you know when they start to incubate, that means you have a very fixed uh, diffusion distance uh, that has to travel and you can time it. Uh, so now what you do is you control these flow rates and concentrations and, and arrive at different controlled um, part net lipoplex sizes. So that size, the hypothesis is if, if a different size of lipoplex is there, it will, it will it, depending on your cell culture, will have a different um, transfection uh, efficiency. And we did prove that, um, which is demonstrated here in this plot here, where you have different um, different sizes of um, lipoplexes that we generated, and you can see there is a different CV, meaning there's different transfection efficiency. And if you have the same size, they all have about the same transfection efficiency. Um, doesn't mean that it's it's the optimal size, it just means that it's, it's consistent, meaning that the size does affect the transfection. Um, and so all you have to, well not all you have to, but some, what some one would do then is for your transfection agent and the, the DNA you're trying to deliver, you would then ramp, you would then create different monodisperse uh, lipoplexes and find out what is the maximum transfection efficiency? Instead of what the what we do with the a typical kit is a, a handshaking uh, method of generating these little plexes, and there is a good reason to do that because um, what happens you get a, a large range of sizes here. You have a polydispersed size. So we have some some that are small, some that are big. Turns out one of these size ranges might be your maximal uh, deficient delivery efficiency um, size range, and so you might you might end up being lucky and this, this uh, size range within uh, is maximum in your population of sizes. Um, but in the picoliter incubator you have this very controlled size. Oh, I'm sorry, the, this is not efficiency, this is just the percent of, um, of sizes. So the idea is now I can take, I think this is, out. so we do mechanical sometimes does win. <laughs> Um, so you see that the size here is, is all kind of one single size and, and you can now control the different sizes, eventually do the transfection um, experiments, culture, and find out you know, what is the maximum. Uh, but they would then be size dependent efficiency. A last kind of example, similar example is this, um, is taking advantage of laminar flow 
entering the droplet as time zero, eventually getting, um, getting rapid mixing, or at least knowing when the mixing is completed, then you need to verify it experimentally at a certain time. Uh, that's when you start to, to know when, for in this case, it's molecular beacon and target, target gene. And as I uh, introduced earlier, for those that you probably, most of you know, but this uh, idea is the molecular beacon normally has a stem portion that's, that's binding together because there's complementary strands that are designed into the molecular beacon. And when you, when you meet a, um, a target DNA, that it, it opens up the loop portion, uh, forcing it to open. And the fluorescence then is far away from the quenching molecule so that it will light up. So in this case, we're just saying bring these two molecules together in the droplet, 3D mixing, knowing when it's fully mixed, knowing the diffusion time because it's, you, you know from size and, and um, the diffusion rate. Uh, so you know when it starts, that means you have time zero and uh, eventually the fluorescence will start to light up because of the molecular beacons being opened up and that's a dynamic kind of process. Uh, so you can see the fluorescence gradually increases until it saturates um, and we're able to now just look at the dynamics of different DNA, meaning the different sequences. If you have a sequence base pair mismatch or you have a different location of the mismatch, you will create different types of saturation fluorescence signals. So um, and again, this, the unique thing about this is it's very difficult to do this any other way because you will have to have time zero or you have to have a single molecule. And, and single molecule, you have to know when the molecule arrives and diffusion time. So, th so this is a way you can do ensemble yet do very accurate, um, accurate kind of um, kinetic of uh, binding experiments. Um, the next example some of you may have seen is, is again taking instead of one drop coming past, past a, a fixed location at a time, you generate a lot of these droplets. Um, the digital biology is an example of, of why it's powerful. Uh, if you have a very low um, abundance molecule like this big test tube with a little red uh, molecule in there, then you have a certain concentration that's very, very low. Um, if you are able to compartmentalize or break up the, the big volume to many, many small volumes, so each, per, each, each compartmentalized droplet, for example, then would be a much higher concentration, right? So going from atomolar to picomolar, for example. Um, and, uh, and if you were able to control location, meaning that you can you microfabricate, which we can, uh, these droplets that pass through a detector, it don't have to be very high sensitivity detector, you now have increased the, um, the concentration several orders of magnitude higher, so you get a very high uh, detection um, efficiency. Um, and the other thing, but, but the downside of it is that you have this Poisson's ra uh, distribution um, that you have to take in, into consideration. So you meaning you have number of droplets, number of uh, particles or, or molecules per number of droplets. I if you exceed a certain ratio, then you start to have many, many droplets. It's not digital anymore because you have many droplets that have more than one uh, molecule. So you gotta have the sweet spot. In this case, about 0.33 is when you start to get to the, ra the Poisson's distribution where you have mostly one or zero, um, which means less than 30, less than a third of the, the um, droplets need to have particles or, or, or that way the distribution will, will guarantee uh, the percentage being very high of digital biology. So, um, with, with that in mind, you want, if you wanted to, um, oh, okay, we go back to this. So, I think I'll, I'll skip this, but this idea here is like a flow type cytometry. You encapsulate single cell. This is a collaboration with John, Jeff Wong at Johns Hopkins, which is up down Baltimore. Um, you, ca you can encapsulate the single cell, like this is a water uh, analysis project. We took droplets and having single cells um, with, the, with, the, with the low abundance, we can ensure that it's only single cell or none. Um, we have it co um, delivered with the lysate probe mixture. And the, probe, the lysate breaks the cells, the probe uh, attaches to target analyte if it's in existence. In this case, we're looking at 16S rRNA. Um, and then that would light it up. So you can actually look at the results, which is, which is pretty, I, I felt this was pretty exciting um, paper back then. Um, you can not only, first of all, look at the dye, you can put dextran or whatever background in there. Uh, look at the single cell passing through. Uh, you can see down there the bottom 
uh, uh, chart here is a single cell passing through it's, that are empty. If you have a single cell in there before it's sliced, you can see that peak. And then if a single cell has the specific 16S RNA, RNA in there, then you would see those peaks as well. So you can go from uh, a single cell down to single molecule within the single drop, uh, which is, which I think has has it's a it's demonstration to make it realis realistic. Um, we we didn't push it to the next level, but I, I think there's there's still some issues in terms of crosstalk and everything else. But but the demonstration shows that this is truly an analytical down to single cell, single single molecule resolutions. Um, I was kind of trying to get to this point here, where you can make lots of droplets. You want to make enough droplets. So if you want to get the high dynamic range, you need to take this fluid and break it down to as many droplets as possible. That would give you the highest digital biology dynamic range. The problem is, if you're going to do something that, if you're, if you're a molecule or your detection sensitivity becomes, it becomes too small, it's very hard to detect. Um, so you need a certain uh, amplification, and, and that's where um, some recent work in, in several groups, um, including back then when we started, uh, were trying to do digital PCR. Uh, so what they did, had to do was try to amplify the uh, fluorescence uh, of the, um, of the of, we have to amplify the DNA so you have enough signal. Um, so what we were, we, the approach we took, different from some of the uh, other groups were doing, was trying to make in a large array. Uh, and the reason why, well, one of the reasons back then was a cool. You can make, make a window, make a million droplets. Um, we, could, we can look at all million droplets at one time uh, and also monitor them through the thermal cycling. Um, so, um, so Andrew was, was a student leading that effort. He, um, uh, what we did instead of um, making a single drop and just a single channel and breaking, we, we did this splitting and we split about, we split one big mother droplets into um, one, 100, uh, 256 so the eight, eight consecutive times, um, because of laminar flow again, uh, you don't you don't have if you even have tiny tiny defects. As long as most of the uh, channels are well done, um, you would imagine there might be some defects in here that would cause. But what happens? We can we evaluated evaluated the the size. It's still within the two percent to five percent uh, difference difference in the sizes. But we are able to generate a million drops. You know, within a couple minutes. Um, and the droplet size that I was trying to get to is the size couldn't be too small because if it's too small with the, cons with the reagents of PCR, um, they become too small to the fact that you cannot, after, after a while, uh, after a number of cycle, several cycling, it starts to deplete the reagents to a point where you can't see, I mean you don't have enough amplification reagents left for the number of uh, molecules that you want to amplify it to. Um, so it turns out that you have to, um, you have to have the size around 50, about 40, 50 picoliters, um, and the size for PCR reagent was 50 microliters, so we were able to get around a million drops, so it was giving us about 26 uh, PCR, and we actually got up to 40, as you might see in the next slide. Oh, this, this shows the, the, the droplet generation of a large array. Again, I can make about a million. And back then, with relatively slow generation of the mother droplets, but because of the splitting consecutively, um, splitting and rapid splitting, you can get about a million drops per two minutes. Um, and the other nice thing about it is you're, you're delivering, instead of one nozzle, which creates lots of dead volume and some laminar flow profiles, uh, you can parallelly deliver them into a big chamber like this one, which is three to four centimeters in size. Um, another thing that Andrew pushed hard was to try to, uh, three to four centimeters, if you do the calculation of 50 micron or so diameter droplets in a 2D kind of a plane, 2D plane, um, you still don't have a million drops. So if someone did the calculation in their head, like the one on the left here, um, turns out you had to stack them to get them into that size range, which is somewhat manageable with our imaging capabilities. Uh, so they had to be stacked in, this thir in the Z direction. So you had to have droplets start to stack up and down and you have this crystalline plane created uh, in a way. Um, but you can't go more than three layers because you start to have overlap lapping of the fluorescence um, and to the point where you cannot distinguish. Uh, for two to three layers you sort of can still, you, with image, with simple, well simple enough uh, image uh, analysis you can make out which one is on the bottom, top, and middle layers. Um, so you can calculate the number of droplets um, in this PCR uh, array. 
So this is the real-time PCR over each cycle. As you can see the, piece, the fluorescence start to increase, increase, increase until 40 cycles and it sort of saturates and down here is the still images every 15, 20, all the way up to 40 cycles of the PCR amplification demonstrated in this um, platform. It, it's taking only one bit, one angle so you can see them very individually. Um, however, the camera setup that we have um, allows us to, it's a very simple setup, it's just, but it has a large area imaging capability with a, with a full screen, full, full scale uh, resolution um, camera, it's a Canon camera basically, a CMOS uh, 21 megapixel uh, sensor uh, allows us to get about tw uh, average around 20 pixels per droplet um, because we're about a million droplets. Um, so um, that way we are able to do real-time PCR which, which essentially means you're looking at all the droplets simultaneously and looking at their fluorescence increase over that period, over this thermocycling uh, duration. And um, in this dynamic range um, that we talked about earlier uh, was able to go about five orders of magnitude going from about maybe 80 or, 80 or so um, DNA uh, hits all the way up to around 10, uh, 100,000 uh, DNA and uh, potentially can go up further. There's many tricks that you can play uh, with this platform. But, but I think if someone were to use it, they would pro probably, Ian, right? He would probably be able to look at the thermal cycling, the melting temperature and all those things that, that might uh, shed more information about the individual DNA and, and the uh, sequences that might affect that fluorescence increase every cycle and look at them in an ensemble. Um, so, so once you have made a lot of these, make the droplets, um, you start to mix different things into it. Uh, as, a, as an engineer, you start to think, oh, but I need to, there's many more things you wanted to do. Uh, one thing might be if you have certain reactions, and many, many chemists, synthetic chemists, polymer chemists, want to synthesize material in these droplets, they might put in uh, various polymer precursors and then gel them um, or polymerize them uh, or if laser polymerize them and so on. Um, so what if you can detect or you can sort them um, based on their chemical endpoint, uh, for example, or even dynamically start to sort them. So these are, many groups have done things. We've done things with electrical impedance and, uh, and we're continuing to do that. There's, well, this was one example of where Andrew, <coughs> there was a need or there was actually a request, a little funding we got from Lawrence Livermore, uh, my old uh, employer, um, to try to do it passively. So the idea was to look at the viscoelastic property of the, of the droplet. So if you have something in there that's changing its property viscoelastically, um, can you use that as a property to, sort, to start to sort them in a microchannel? Again, they're a laminar flow. They won't cross lanes, but if you have, if you have um, a particle, this is how I look at it, is if a particle is large enough that it's already crossing the lanes, then it can decide which lane to, to, to merge into. Um, so in this case, we would have um, the PC, for instance, if it's PCR or if it's a polymerization coming through viscoelastic property um, and the visco, viscosity ratio, we'll, we found that, that it, dict it will be um, the migration of the droplet towards a high, sh high shear versus low shear range, low shear meaning in the middle, lar lar high shear in the edge of the channels, uh, will be dictated by the viscoelast vis viscosity ratio and, and whether it's, high, it's highly viscoelastic or, or low viscoelastic properties. And using that, um, again, its details are in the paper. Uh, we are able to um, very do rapid separation uh, within minutes. We can separate out uh, these n known um, viscoelastic property uh, polymers um, in, in a way that we add a glycerol and change the viscosity ratio and then change it from the middle to the side migration. So it's more of a demonstration that this can work. Um, in order to do it for PCR or other things, we didn't get quite get to that. Um, it, it just means that you need to tune it to the right viscosity ratios to make something like that work. And, and, um, and I, I think potentially that could work. So, in the, so you, by, um, by tuning the viscosity ratios, and sometimes you might have additives to it uh, if you can, um, and then knowing that it's a, which, which viscoelastic um, regime it's in, you can separate them just 
just by collecting them downstream. So we collect them in 90 plus percent um, were the right particles that were separated. So we push, pushed in different particles, I mean droplets, uh, with different polymer combinations. So another thing you might want, so, so that process, there are many, many groups, so I, I just kind of used a few examples here and there to demonstrate um, the processing of droplets being generated and separated and screened, uh, collected, for example. Uh, another part of my lab, which was the original motivation I mentioned earlier, was trying to make this artificial cell. Um, and, and the idea, again, was taking vesicles and what the cell itself has um, has not only the cell membrane itself, but has little vesicles also have membranes, and they're cro they're trafficking different molecules at different parts of the cell, creating all the functions and many of the functions that are um, happening in the cell. You know, br bringing enzyme reactions to the right place, um, doing targeting or doing synthesis of molecules in different parts of the cell. Um, so. Long-term goal is hopefully you have different vesicles moving around doing certain things that are mim mimicking the cell. Um, I know Don does a lot of liposomes as well. We're, we're trying to focus on large vesicles um, as, as kind of a sweet spot in a sense, um, triggering cell-based response. Um, and then maybe hopefully working, um, in some cases we might, I, I don't think we'll, our technology has anything to do with the nanoscale ones, but I think um, one area that might might be interested is is drug drug delivery or or multifunctional part uh, cell based sizes. Nice thing about cell, you can encapsulate cells cells within the artificial cell um, and create certain functions that might might um, allow diffusion or or membrane to control what goes in and out of that um, that space. Um, this is a little bit different but somewhat along the same motivation. Um, we we then started to make. We make droplets. Uh, we go to conferences, and then one one uh, one of the um, attendees happened to be someone that's in ultrasound. So he said, "Why can't you make gas bubbles?" So we made a lot of gas bubbles um, with lipid shells, so they're stable enough to circulate. And and the main thing, of course, again, is using microfluidics. You make the monodisperse the same size, so when the ultrasound comes in, uh, ultrasound contrast becomes very um, very. Predictable because your 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 ultrasound frequency is a certain range. If you're all the same size, the response of the scattering is about the same range. So you can have all of the um, contrast agents reflect or scatter or amplify the ultrasound signal. I mean imaging signal. Um, so you can deliver fewer particles, meaning meaning less a uh, fewer side effects. Uh, another variation of that is using these phase change uh, materials. So the phase change. This is a liquid to gas phase transformation, activated by heat or ultrasound. So if you uh, can imagine, you can make small, tiny droplets that, that go freely circulate in your body, but once you know there is a certain area that you can focus your energy in, ultrasound or heat or, 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 or optical energy, and activate them, they would actually in expand 20 times or more in size. So this is the same magnification from small liquid droplets to gas ones, and they stay intact with the lipid shell keeps them in play, from merging with each other. Um, but the idea is this gas embolotherapy that we might be able to focus our energy in a certain location where then uh, it chokes off the tumor or chokes off an area that you want necrosis to happen uh, in a triggered fashion. Um, and other ways to, to make multi-layers is what our lab does a lot. We just make different layers and what, depending on the application we might lipid shell, in this case a drug, uh, medium layer and a gas core. Gas core is for ultrasound, not only ultrasound imaging, but ultrasound um, manipulation, meaning you can have these um, these waves that can pin most of the, the, the ultrasound, these particles to one location and then increase the intensity to the, if you decide that to do it, increase it enough to break them um, so that the drug locally gets delivered. Um, so another example of this, this external in vivo uh, and field-based um, but targeted um, treatment. Uh, we did a lot of scale up, multiple channels, multiple, uh, so that we can create uh, enough of these particles for animal experiments, which is ongoing. Um, this is David, uh, my grad student, and now at now at um, now at Allergan. Um, he he 
he not only did these face change and these fast generation, but he was interested in the education module. His wife taught at high school. He said, can I take these droplets to high schools and, sh and demonstrate it without all the fancy you know, pumps and so on. So he, he, j he basically created this um, hand syringe based operation and he was able to, to control the different regimes of droplet generation and I won't go into details but it goes from geometry mediated meaning um, it's, a, it's a shear but geometry allowing uh, expansion and, and shearing break off of the droplets versus um, the so-called um, the so-called the dripping regime where, where your droplets just break off through instability of the interfaces um, with, with just handheld um, devices and we're trying to make this into a, a mobile one so we can take it to conferences and demonstrate the droplets on site. Um, but it just mentions that's very very simple process. Um, so uh, very quickly I wanted to go from molecules to cell, cell and this is this is a project that may take too much time but I'll try to give you the big picture. We have um, these neuro stem cell collaborator that's interested in transplant uh, transplantation of neuro stem cells for delivery in in two applications. One is for neurodegenerative diseases into the brain, and another is spinal cord injury. And so it's it's different applications, but using the same stem cell prop population. And the and we back then uh, she she was telling me that every time you this is Lisa Flanagan, every time we tried they tried to. Uh, create the right microenvironment so that we take these cells and hopefully generate neurons for the applications. Um, he, there's, there's always this fluctuation based on the batch of cells they get. They're all the same size, they have no markers for what becomes a progenitor, I mean, what becomes a neural, neural progenitor versus astrocyte um, and oligodendrocyte, the, the other types of glial cells. Um, so, so she came to me and we just said, oh, how do we, how can we find out? Because you think, what we're thinking is, which is, became proven, is that the cells were actually heterogeneous to begin with. No matter how you create them, there's always progenitor cells already formed based on whatever situation they were harvested from. Um, and our hypothesis was that uh, if it's a neuron cell, there's a lot more electrical, act actu at least that was the idea back then, that there's a lot of electrical activity starting to form even though there's no true marker. The sizes are the same, you can't use size to separate them. Uh, so we said, let's look at the electrical properties. That's kind of triggered us to go from MHD to DEP um, and uh, dielectrophoresis for a, a quick, quick summary is that it's, a, it's using um, a non-uniform electrical field um, and polarizing the, uh, the particle that's that usually a dielectric, so you can polarize it, the charges. That, that difference between the conductivity or the dielectric property of the particle and the surrounding fluid creates a net force either towards or away from the high density field, a high, um, the high intensity field. So you can use that as a way to say, when does it flip from negative to positive in frequency domain? And that's kind of the basis of uh, how we looked at these cells and we, and we started to characterize them based on their property. Javier was the one that developed this so-called dielectric activated cell sorting technique. It's, it's just trapping because we just wanted to look at a, way, a quick way to characterize the cells, look at the, their dielectric property. What, where is that frequency that starts to flip from pushing away from electrodes to trapping to electrodes and, um, and then uh, use frequency to band them. Um, so he had these trapping electrodes, uh, we had these valves generated, very, um, very similar to some of the valves I saw today, um, and uh, basically controlling the flow going from straight down or past collection chambers. Uh, use the frequency to turn on and off of each of these trapping zones so we can band the different cells that are trapped between different frequencies from F1, F2, F3 for example, and, um, and prove that we can do that. Um, this is just the movie of, of trapping and showing that we, we as, a flow, as the cells pass through, we trap them and eventually we change the direction of valves and, and create a uh, pressure difference so that it would, they would collect it in, in one of the collection chambers. Oh. So, um, so we've since taken this to a big sheath. So we can do parallel sheath flow and collect them and we're trying to do, uh, we'll hopefully be able to do animal experiments soon. Um, but we've proven that these small devices gave, give us the characterization and we had a stem cell paper, a stem cell, the journal stem cells paper, that proven that once we 
expand them with frequency, we, we first delivered known cells that have different properties and, and shown that there are differences in these bands. Uh, then we took all the way to the recent paper where we took unknown populations. We just take whatever harvest cells we come in, we separate them with the frequencies, collect them, and then we expand them and look at what they become and we enrich the neurons. Uh, and it was the first time anyone could ever enrich neuron cells through these neurostem cell um, through using these neural stem cells, we can we can enrich them, and for so that's that was good. So that means that now you can use its biophysical properties alone to separate, enrich them, and become uh, for for the purpose of transplantation. Um, so they're very excited. They're continuing to get a lot of funding from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine for treating spinal cord injury and potentially eventually to get to. Neuro, uh, the neuroregenerative ones. This just shows the initial results that showed enrichment in the in the neurons with the right fre with a frequency band of 400 to 5,000 kilohertz. Down the road, which we we started with this because I'm a MEMS person by training originally, we we worked on a way to do t 2D, basically a continuous flow sorting. This is early early work. One of my first PhD students, um, but we he created this very neat device, kind of complicated, but what it is is dual frequency um, neg negative DP. Negative DP is kind of significant because most of the conductive fluid based um, DP is pos is um, you, most of the DEP experiments, if you look at the details, they actually have to put in um, low conductivity fluids so that they can create this trapping effect because it's usually naturally negative DEP. So this way you don't have to change your media. You can keep it in the media that's happy with. You trap, let the cells come through. They push the, the DEP field from the top and bottom, push each other to an equilibrium point, and based on its dielectric property, it will then, if the equilibrium point is past the central line and goes topwards, and if you control the frequency that then the other ones may go downwards so you can separate cells continuously based on its dielectric property. Uh, we've shown some results. We can switch the same, just switch the uh, intensity, I mean, the amplitude from the top to bottom and do a switch. Everything experiences the same equilibrium point, even the cell different ones. You can switch them one to five channels uh, or you can have them um, with, um, with the same amplitude but different frequencies and that will give you a different equilibrium point and you know you can see the large whiter cells go upwards and the small beads go downwards and this is this was of course not not the end result we now can possibly take the results that we have to uh, apply towards um, towards the neural stem cells themselves um, we, we started a little late can, we, can I talk one more Talk for as long as you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I know it's five o'clock. So I know many. Of you, if you need to leave, that's I understand. So, <laughs> um, so this is a project that's it's getting to become a bigger part of my lab, which is as I mentioned was doing bottom up. I mean, now we talked about cells, a little bit of cells and, and DNA and so on. Um, and I do have some protein project as well, um, but. This is the, the area where we're starting to get to more complicated uh, systems. So, so it's a collaboration. Steve George, uh, my colleague, um, uh, came to me and said, I want to, I've been working on with another collaborator, Chris Hughes, which is an angiogenesis um, anastomosis expert in, bi in molecular biology. He's the molecular biology chair. Steve George was our former chair and I'm the current chair. Um, and Steve George is becoming chair at WashU, so he's leaving us, but uh, we're still collaborating. Um, but the idea is to generate tissue on a chip that is much more physiological. And this, at that time, when they started, was not as big push. Now it's a big thing. NIH is pumping millions and millions of dollars in this tissue on a chip area. Um, we're, we're fortunate to ride this wave a little bit. We have good funding from NIH to do this. Um, but the idea is the 3D tissue, not only 3D tissue, but have vascularized tissue, not only vascularized tissue, but have vascularized tissue anastomose to microfluidic channels. Um, the advantage here, or the potential here, is that I can have something much like circulation, well, it's not, not yet, you don't, uh, well, uh, something that mimics the circulation in the system, right? You have the arterial and the venal side, and then connected by connective tissue, which has capillary beds in there, um, and has this exchange, hopefully eventually, that's much more physiological, much more metabolically um, mimicking our real tissue. So that was the idea. Um, and so we, we set out to do this um, in a way uh, the proposal was written mostly for drug discovery, I mean, finding leads and so on that are much more representative of your, of your um, 
of the drug that works for you. And it's obviously applying towards personalized medicine because now you can take your own cells, generate IPS, der derivatized tissue, so you can generate your own heart cells, your own um, dermal cells, whatever cells you're trying to look for, um, you can generate. So, so that becomes the purpose. Now, so it might, uh, the hope is that we can take this, improve it, um, predicts drugs better than even animal models, and that would be a big hit, of course. The, so what we do here is the high pressure, low pressure, gener generating a, um, a condition that has mechanical cues and chemical cues. Mechanical cues and chemicals together dictate how well you can create this, NS, I mean this angiogenesis or vasculogenesis, creating this vascularized, vascular bed um, network that uh, create, uh, and then now what we're working on, hopefully the next paper, a microtest paper will hopefully get in and then get a, get a journal paper, is, is really controlling that connection between, you know, the biological vessels and microfluidic channels. Uh, and we can do it at high throughput. Some of this, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of details in the papers you may want to look at. Um, and uh, we worked through the cardiovascular center, that's why we have this heart-like uh, organ. Um, but the, idea, the purpose, the, the one thing that we discovered along the way is that we tried to generate these vascular beds um, and we wanted to just, uh, Sean, with my former postdoc, wanted to just look at the different mechanical cues um, and see how that affects the uh, vascularization or vasculogenesis is, is what they call it here with the, with the different cells that they seed in there, uh, endothelial cells, um, and the uh, fibroblasts and so on. Um, he wanted to see if I create different pecklet numbers, which is the ratio between um, convection and I mean diffu uh, convection and diffusion. Um, what happens? So uh, again, not going into all the different numbers. There's high interstitial flow. This is interstitial flow, and then med intermediate and then low pecklet number. And low pecklet number just means it's diffusion dominated, high pecklet number means it's um, convection dominated, and in between means it's somewhat in between. So, um, it, and what we found, as you can see here, hopefully it's obvious to you as well, this is not, not, not completely quantitative, but in this particular graph, but you can see there's reasonable generation of vascular, uh, vascularization here and reasonable down in the low pecklet number, uh, which we call a hypoxia condition, and this is interstitial flow condition, where somewhere in between, you would think that both can contribute part of it, you would have also vascularization, but that was not the case. Um, so we actually were puzzled for a while. Even my expert physiologists, physio physiology experts in, in, um, and collaborators were, were kind of puzzled. But later, later our, our explanation was that you, um, you have high interstitial flow in development side when you're growing. You have lots of need, so there's a lot of flow can pushing out to grow your tissue. And then the hypoxia is like, like when you have a wound, when you have your, your lack of your nutrients and oxygen is de depleted. Um, those are times when the body generates factors for um, creating the blood vessels. But in between, when you're mature like we are, we don't have a lot of growth, new growth of vascular, and so maybe that makes sense. So, but that was a good way, the only way, I think, the thing about this, we send it to science, we send it to these tough journals, no one, no one of course, accepted. Um, the, I, think, I think the thing about a lot of microfluidics is that you can do things, you can measure things never pe before, but you can't be the first, because you always are demonstrating something that they already sort of know, they sort of know the convective is this way, sort of know hypoxia is this way, but they never really were able to pin down you know, what exact number it is, which engineers can do, but unfortunately was not appreciated <laughs> as much. <laughs> I still think it's cool. Um, so, so this is just showing that the, the vessels are reasonably, again, there's many other tests to be done, but they're reasonably impenetrable, meaning they're impermeable. So we put these um, dextran molecules, they're small um, molecules, 70 kilo, kilo uh, daltons, and, um, and there's very little, there's, there's almost no leakage in the endothelial, the, in, the, in the vessel walls. Um, and we put in beads. We can connect them, and uh, this was before we worked on that process. It's we actually it's been a few years, three four years, trying to make a better connection here. As you can see on the top here, was high pressure area. There's a lot of bees that are leaking because it's not completely um, sealed. Um, but now we have some some proof that it, it, we probably have that fixed now. So it'll be very exciting that we can now look at flow rate, 
how much here you're generating, and, and then also deliver in, eventually delivering more biological solutions instead of just media. A uh, little bit of confoco showing, and some of the beads that are also shown. The, the um, red fluorescent beads are there, and then um, the cell uh, nucleuses are the blue. Okay, so, uh, yeah. This is a micro pump and a di diagnostic project that I think, well, I'll just show you one here. Um, this is acoustic cavity, so we make a channel with side channels that are dead end. Uh, when, and um, Don and I are actually working on trying to make this more in different plastic. We did this in PDMS, miraculously it, it worked. Um, the dead end channel just traps air, uh, liquid in the middle. So we delivered in 50% um, blood and I think we did whole blood too, but this is not whole blood. Um, but what happens is you have a pretty unique device that acts, initially we just present it as a pump. If you put fluid in there, um, what the acoustic um, trapping, uh, the, the acoustic streaming creates um, vortices that trap particles. And we have a paper in, in review right now that shows how we can, uh, well at least explains how this is being, uh, trapping is size dependent. So we can, at least in the paper, five to ten microns, we can have five microns and ten microns totally separated without any external pump. It's just acoustic, um, it, uh, um, acoustic transducer on the bottom and we just slap the um, device on top of it. We, put, we may put ultrasound GL or not. We can put a very thin layer of PDMS that also works uh, for the transmission of the ultrasound energy. Um, creates that vortice and when you have this uh, slanted um, side channels, it creates a rectifying effect so that most of it, for, there's a net flow in the, in the bulk flow in, the, in, in one direction. Uh, whereas, but there's also vortices still um, trapping particles, so you have this trap, pumping and trapping um, integrated device. Um, if you see here, Arlene actually starting a company with, with some of this technology from the lab. Um, you can see those little um, knots, so to speak, uh, that are basically red blood cell being trapped. Um, and then the front end, you can see the yellowish still traveling because it's still pumping. Um, but the blood cells are left behind. Um, up to here, you can see the front here still moving. I don't know if you see it in the middle. But that's where the, the plasma is continuing to be pushed forward. And then there's an area where we can, we can, we can just uh, pull out. There's, there's some integrated device that they since developed um, that we can pull out the serum or the, um, the plasma for plasma separation. So it's a very rapid, very low, very small. You can put a drop of blood, immediately separate it out for various protein or DNA analysis. Um, okay, like I said, there's there's many applications, including agglutination, sensing. <coughs> Our lab, I saw so many Arduino here in, at uh, University of Maryland. They're also doing a lot of that here, using the cell phone to control operation for a protein um, diagnostics uh, project. Oops. Am I going upwards? Sorry. I just want to summarize. I wanted to show, since I'm, you know, I am the chair, so I'm always obligated to introduce our department real quickly. Just one slide. <laughs> um, we have three main, er main expertise in our disciplines that we kind of focus on. Uh, biophotonics, we have all the way from laser, these are all centers that are in parentheses. Um, laser, uh, laboratory fluorescence dynamics goes, really can monitor real time, non-invasively cell, uh, molecular events inside the cell, trafficking and so on. Um, and then we go all the way to Beckman Laser Institute, takes all the way from cellular all the way to organ, so we can do breast cancer, other types of clinical, there's a clinic in BLI in the biophotonics area, these are different disciplines, so we set, we set our uh, goal to create these three areas, micro nanofluidics or micro nanotechnology and then here we, we didn't do a lot of computation in the department but we did this, CCBS does a lot of system biology, synthetic biology, but we also been developing, we felt that tissue engineering modeling itself is where that became a core in the department. So whenever you do something, you need no modeling, you know physiology, you know the, the cell signaling. So we collaborate with the other centers, those two centers, and some of the tissue engineering um, expertise to create that discipline. So these areas, of course, are easy to crosstalk, develop technologies that, um, that are integrated. Um, but then they are guided in the BME sense, guided by, ap by clinical applications, for instance, neuro, cardiovascular, cancer. Um, those are also centers affiliated with those three clinical areas. 
and whenever they have a call or some need, uh, where our hope is that BME department can quickly assemble the right expertise in one of the, each of these areas and have some kind of a comprehensive solution for them. Um, so to sum up, I kind of explained the bottom-up bio medical engineering or bottom-up biosystems, bioengineering is what I like to now thought about this morning, <laughs> new word to say. Uh, but all the way up, I think this integration, there's still so much to do for those that are students. I mean, in the many years, there's going to be so many things you can do to, to integrate and create function, create information processing that the body itself does, but we have no way to recreate, uh, much like the tissue side of things. Um, you can create it and, and really um, find the right dosage, find the right drug, find the right molecule, and so on. Um, but it's, it's pretty exciting that the MEMS and micro nano area allow you to do that. That, that was just representing my old work when I was at Lawrence Livermore. We made little tools that go into the body, so we had to make things small enough to go in the vessels, arteries, so we can treat brain aneurysms, treat heart diseases, and so on. Now we have to make even smaller things to go inside the cell, is the idea to, to operate on the cell itself. Um, artificial cells and so on. I want to acknowledge the uh, funding agencies. My, this is an old picture, but it's just the nicest picture, so I always use this. Um, a lot of the students are, a lot of work I showed were, old, were former students, so a lot of them are in this picture, so that's also another reason I keep this picture a lot. Um, I also want to show this because uh, Don and I are actually going to host the, um, the main conference in our field, Microtasks, in 2017. So I'm very excited. I probably will probably go back and forth to our each other and go down to Savannah, Georgia, which is where we've chosen the site to be um, in 2017. So some of you may, may be able to come there. Hopefully you can and uh, join us and help Don when he needs committees. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it.